Hi, I'm Mark Levin, and I want to thank the Leadership Institute for giving me this uh, opportunity to discuss something that's very, very important to me, the courts in the context of the Constitution and federalism, and particularly individual liberty. You know, the framers of the Constitution anticipated many things. They were concerned about a national executive, the president, becoming a tyrant, so they created a powerful legislature and an independent judiciary to slake presidential ambitions. They worried about the momentary passions of a tempestuous time inflaming the populace and by extension the Congress. So they created the presidential veto. They divided the legislative authority between a House of Representatives selected by the people and a Senate chosen by the state legislatures. Now some of the framers also feared a too autonomous judiciary that would grow in power and purview and eventually subsume the other branches of the federal government and the states. To protect against this, they granted Congress the power to define both the size of the Supreme Court and the makeup of the federal court system. Now, um, with only a few exceptions, they also granted Congress the power to determine the original and appellate jurisdictions of every federal court. In addition, to ensure that both the executive and judicial branches did not become sinecures for corrupt office holders, they granted Congress the power to impeach and remove judges and most federal officials up to and including the president in certain cases. And in order to help control the scope and reach of the national government and to protect the states from being devoured, they enumerated in great detail the powers and limitations of the federal authority both in the Constitution itself and what would later become the Bill of Rights, that is the first 10 amendments approved by the first Congress and ratified by the states in 1791. Beyond being free of undue influence, the framers also realized the judiciary's independence had to come with some significant strings attached in order to fit into a Republican form of government. Federal judges were expected to adjudicate cases and controversies that arose under federal criminal law and civil statutes and do very little beyond that scope. Contrary to the opinions of some notable Supreme Court justices and others down through the years, the reason the framers did not specifically grant to the Supreme Court the much broader authority to judge the constitutionality of federal laws is because there was strong sentiment that such a function was well outside the authority of judges. This is the reason Congress was granted authority to structure the courts in the first place. In particular, on June 4, 1787, at the Constitutional Convention, the delegates from 12 states took up the issue of granting the national executive, the title of president hadn't been adopted yet, the ability to give a negative, that is a veto, to any act of the national legislature. Now some delegates, including James Madison, the author of the Virginia Plan, that was used as the initial basis for discussions among the delegates, initially favored a council of revision made up of the executive and the judiciary, which could reject acts of the legislature. The convention quickly rejected that idea, though. They didn't want to include the judiciary in such a review process. They didn't want judges involved in the legislative process, thereby reviewing laws they would eventually have to adjudicate. Instead, the delegates came up with the presidential veto. The point is that the framers of the Constitution clearly intended to create intrinsic limitations on the ability of any branch or level of government to have unanswered authority over the other. Furthermore, there can be no doubt that were the conditions that exist today, with the Supreme Court involving itself in minute detail in endless facets of everyday life, known to the convention delegates, they would be appalled. In Federalist Number 78, in 1788, Alexander Hamilton wrote in part that whoever attentively considers the different departments of power must perceive that in a government in which they are separated from each other, the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution because it will be least in a capacity to annoy or injure them. He said the executive not only dispenses the honors, but holds the sword of the community. The legislature not only commands the purse, but prescribes the rules by which the duties and rights of every citizen are to be regulated. 
The judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over either the sword or the purse, no direction either of strength or of the wealth of the society, and can take no active resolution whatsoever. Hamilton said, it may truly be said to, to have neither force nor will, but merely judgment, and must ultimately depend upon the aid of the executive arm even for the efficacy of its judgments. Now this simple view of the matter suggests several important consequences, Hamilton said. It proves incontestably that the judiciary is beyond comparison the weakest of the three departments of power, that it can never attack with success either of the other two, and that all possible care is requisite to enable it to defend itself against their attacks. It equally proves that though individual oppression may now and then proceed from the courts of justice, the general liberty of the people can never be endangered from that quarter. I mean so long as the judiciary remains truly distinct from both the legislative and the executive. An anti-federalist 11, Brutus, believed to be anti-federalist Robert Yates, well, he was alarmed. He warned that the real effect of this system of government will therefore be brought home to the feelings of the people through the medium of the judicial power. It is, moreover, of great importance, he wrote, to examine with care the nature and extent of the judicial power, because those who are to be vested with it are to be placed in a situation altogether unprecedented in a free society. They are to be rendered totally independent, both of the people and the legislature. No errors they may commit can be corrected by any power above them, if any such power there be, nor can they be removed from the office for making ever so many erroneous adjudications. In addition, Yates predicted in Federalist 15 that, quote, perhaps nothing could have been better conceived to facilitate the abolition of the state governments than the constitution of the judicial. He said there will be able to extend the limits of the general government gradually and be insensible degree and by insensible degrees and to accommodate themselves to the temper of the people. Their decisions on the meeting of the Constitution, uh, which will commonly take place in cases which arise between individuals with which the public will not be generally acquainted, one adjudication will form a precedent to the next, and this to a following one. Man was prescient. Yates, who died in 1801, did not live to see the 1803 Supreme Court decision in Marbury versus Madison. No doubt he would have said, I told you so. In his decision, Chief Justice John Marshall wrote, in part, that the judicial power of the United States is extended to all cases arising under the Constitution. Could it be the intention of those who gave this power to say that, in using it, the Constitution should not be looked into? That a case arising under the Constitution should be decided without examining the instrument under which it arises? This is too extravagant to be maintained, said Marshall. It is true, Marshall wrote, that the judiciary should exercise this judicial review power prudently. However, this was of little consolation. By claiming authority not specifically granted by the Constitution, abuses of power would certainly follow, as they certainly have. Although the decision has been lauded by many scholars of all philosophical stripes, the fact is, that the ruling expanded and transmuted the court's limited authority to adjudicate civil disputes and criminal complaints into a judicial oligopoly with few limits on its power. And the extent to which there are limits depends on the forbearance of the very courts that snatched the authority in the first place. It would seem that if a Supreme Court majority of five lawyers have the final word on constitutional matters, then governance comes down to selecting five lawyers this is obviously contrary to the framers' intent. A president serves for limited terms, as do members of Congress. They can be held to account, not so with members of the court who are appointed for life. Had the Constitutional Convention conferred such power on a handful of individuals, which it most assuredly did not, it is indeed doubtful it would have provided no recourse whatsoever. No less than Thomas Jefferson, the original author of the Declaration of Independence, was furious about the Marbury decision. In a letter to Abigail Adams, John Adams' wife, Jefferson wrote a, a year after Marbury was issued that the Constitution meant that its coordinate branches should be checks on each other. But the opinion which gives to the judges the right to decide what laws are constitutional and what not 
not only for themselves and their own sphere of action, but for the legislature and executive also in their spheres, would make the judiciary a despotic branch. Jefferson's concerns with judicial power became even more pronounced as he passed into old age. In 1820, he wrote his friend William Jarvis, he said to consider judges as the, as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. It's a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. Our judges are as honest as other men and not more so, he said. They have with others the same passions for party, for power, and privilege of their core. And their power the more dangerous as they are in office for life and not responsible as the other functionaries are to the elective control. He said the Constitution has erected no such single tribunal, knowing that to whatever hands confided with the corruptions of time and party, its members would become despots. It has more wisely made all the departments co-equal and co-sovereign within themselves. Decades later, President Abraham Lincoln would have to grapple with the Supreme Court's 1856 decision in the notorious Dred Scott versus Sanford case, a complete constitutional abomination. The issues included whether Scott, a slave, could sue for his freedom based as a longtime resident of a free territory, the territories of the Louisiana Purchase, and whether Congress's ban of slavery in those territories was constitutional. Chief Justice Roger Taney, writing for the majority, argued that Scott was not a citizen, for citizenship had been confined to the white race, and therefore he had no standing to sue. Moreover, Congress did not have constitutional authority to ban slavery, he wrote, in those territories because it denied slaveholders property without due process. Should the court have the final say? The Dred Scott decision was a major impetus for the Civil War. On March 4, 1861, during his first inauguration speech, Abraham Lincoln said this, I do not forget the position assumed by some that constitutional questions are to be decided by the Supreme Court, nor do I deny that such decisions must be binding in any case upon the parties to a suit as to the object of that suit. While they are also entitled to very high respect and consideration in all parallel cases by all other departments of government. And while it is obviously possible that such decisions may be erroneous in any given case, Still, the evil effect following it, being limited to that particular case, with the chance that it may be overruled and never become a precedent for other cases, can better be borne than could the evils of a different practice. Lincoln said, at the same time, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be, irre is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, he said, the instant they are made in ordinary litigation between parties in personal actions, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of the imminent tribunal. He said, nor is there in this view any assault upon the court or the judges. It is a duty from which they may not shrink to decide cases properly brought before them, and it is no fault of theirs if others seek to turn their decisions into political process. But less than 50 years later, Woodrow Wilson would take the opposite view. In fact, he endorsed flat-out judicial tyranny. In 1908, Wilson argued that the character of the process of constitutional adoption depends first of all upon the wise or unwise choice of statesmen, but ultimately and chiefly upon the option and purpose of the courts. Wilson said the chief instrumentality by which the law of the Constitution has been extended to cover the facts of national development has of course been judicial interpretations. He said the decisions of the courts. The process of formal amendment of the Constitution was made so difficult by the provisions of the Constitution itself, he wrote, that it has seldom been feasible to use it. And the difficulty of formal amendment has undoubtedly made the courts more liberal not to say more lax in their interpretation than they would otherwise have been. The whole business of adaption has been theirs, and they have undertaken it with open minds, sometimes even with boldness and a touch of audacity. It's worth noting that Lincoln, who insisted on judicial limits, abolished slavery. Contrarily, Wilson, who demanded on an all-powerful court, 
supported segregation. So Wilson's view, in his view, the federal judiciary is to behave as a perpetual constitutional convention without the benefit of representation and input from the states, rewriting the Constitution as a relative handful of judges divine the merits of this or that issue, nearly always promoting the centralization and concentration of power in the federal government. 